So, uh, welcome again. Um, welcome. Thank you, Jorge, for presenting today. So, <laughs> today's seminar um, will uh, uh, be on measuring uh, involuntary formal employment. Uh, by Jorge Avalos, uh, who is an associate professor at Universidad del Pacifico in Lima, Peru. His research focuses on applied labor econometrics, impact evaluation, and trade and labor market outcomes in developing countries. So Jorge will be presenting for around uh, 30 minutes. And after that, we will have some time for questions. So if you have any questions, you can write them in the Q&A box or in the chat box. Um, and, but we'll, we'll, you can, you can uh, write them whenever you, you want, but we'll uh, gather them at the end of the presentation. So Jorge, thank you very much for presenting today and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Carmen. And thanks for the invitation. Uh, um, uh, to participate in this uh, in this seminar, uh, what I'm going to present is uh, it has two two parts. In the first part, we're going to motivate uh, a tool by presenting some operational aspects uh, and computational aspects as well. And then in the second part, we're going to present an application uh, that has been prepared by me and uh, a former research assistant uh, Omar Albuquerque, who is also a co-author of the application that you're going to see. Uh, so um, this is the outline of the presentation. We're going to roughly have a motivation uh, that will uh, introduce uh, the, the, the tool and the uh, and a, a naive example of, of the, this type of models. And then we're going to introduce uh, the application on, uh, on, on this uh, specific uh, topic. So <clears throat> one of the main motivations behind uh, the fact of introducing latent class models is uh, the possibility of modeling an observed heterogeneity in a particular way. The, it, and this particular way consists in assuming that uh, an observed heterogeneity uh, uh, segments or creates groups among the population of individuals that you are studying. In other words, uh, the researcher gathers a sample from a population, uh, but the population uh, on itself uh, is segmented into groups, but the researcher that gathers that information doesn't know nothing at all regarding uh, the membership of their observations into the many groups. So these groups remain hidden to the to the to the researcher, and <clears throat> uh, that's why we're that's that's why this is a, a tool that is quite useful in order to model the observed heterogeneity. There are many applications, mainly in the uh, labor economics and industrial organization literature, and uh, these two authors provide very nice uh, surveys on on how these models have been applied. Uh, <clears throat> into into these topics, uh, specifically, uh, and more, uh, more recent applications come uh, to uh, from from papers from of Hope and Ballon, uh, 2021 and 20, 2019, and Matkin 1992. I mean, this is not uh, exhaustive an exhaustive review, but uh, these papers uh, do apply the an observed, the the latent class approach in order to model random uh, in order to model an observed heterogeneity in a context of uh, discrete choice, discrete choice. In other words, uh, individuals are, uh, are uh, or must take some decisions, must decide on whether to uh, hire a given, a given type of contract or a given type of water service. And uh, in order to model the heterogeneity of individuals, what you can do is to uh, introduce uh, a latent class model in order to try to group these, uh, these individuals into different segments and each segment it will be will have its own characteristics. This is also a way of getting rid of the famous independence of irrelevant alternatives assumption. If you are familiar with uh, multivalent logic models, well, this is also a way of getting rid of that that assumption. Duration models have also been uh, um, uh, treated by these latent class approaches uh, in labor economics, for, for instance, by Heckman and Singer, uh, Abring and Vandenberg. <clears throat> um, if I remember where Abring and Bandeberg uh, introduced this in a, in, in a context of, of uh, it is uh, search and matching or um, monopsonistic competition modeling. And more specifically, <clears throat> if we focus uh, a little bit more into the presentation of the application that we're going to give, <clears throat> this type of model has been applied by Dickens and Lang in a very influential paper published in the American Economy Review in order to model 
uh, whether uh, the, the, the uh, labor markets are segmented or competitive. A similar model has been uh, implemented by Maniac in 1991 in order to test whether labor markets are segmented or competitive. Again, by trying to identify groups within the labor market, hidden groups to the researcher. This paper has been published in Parametric, also a very influential one. And uh, more recently, uh, Gunter and Launau, 2012, uh, published a very influential paper uh, published in their, uh, uh, and this is my mistake, this is not Review of Development Economics, this is Journal of Development Economics, where they model uh, the, the uh, uh, where they uh, specify a model that allows for the identification of voluntary and involuntary informal employment based on wage max maximizing workers. Basically, they assume that informal workers may be hidden within, um, within two regimes within the informal segment. <clears throat> so let's motivate this by a naive example. We all have been exposed to this type of, of, of models, right? Uh, a linear model, uh, a linear model where, um, uh, given variable y depends on x, uh, an x vector, a vector of regressors. Uh, in the in the uh, um, in the latent class approach, we sample data about y and x, of course, without any knowledge about the membership into a jade segment. We don't know whether an individual belongs to a jade segment. Okay, we 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 denote each uh, and every one of these segments as latent classes because they are not observed. Uh, in the labor economics literature, it's quite usual. Uh, we, you, you may model the wages as, as a function of uh, human capital determinants, but you can also consider, consider that unobserved abilities and skills may moderate the returns of the characteristics. In other words, education may influence wages, but the impact of education on wages may be a function or may, mo may be moderated by the level of observed, unobserved abilities or skills. These unobserved abilities or skills could be considered discrete. We may have many levels. Well, in the very basic case, in the very basic case where we don't have, uh, well, this is also, this is also not good. Uh, in the very simple case where you where, where we, you don't have any regimes, in the in the case where j is equal to one, in the case where there is no regimes, uh, the classical approach is simply to get an OLS estimate. And the OLS estimate is equal to the maximum likelihood estimate. And this is uh, one way of writing the maximum likelihood estimate. But what if you have many segments? What if you have two segments? And this is the, this is the specification of the, of the likelihood function. If you have two segments, you have the term associated to pi one, which will be the density of your wage residual associated to the first segment, and you will have the second uh, term, which is phi of uh, ui beta 2, which will be the density of the second segment. As you can see, both exist for the same individual. Uh, each one of these densities doesn't uh, turn off or on. Both exist for the same individual and are averaged by the pi 1 uh, probability. Pi 1 is the probability of belonging to the first group and one minus pi one must be the probability of belonging to the second group. So this will be the basic uh, way of writing the likelihood function. And of course, the estimator will be the vector of betas that, maximize this, that maximizes this likelihood function. Now, in order to be successful uh, in the estimation of this model, uh, well, beta one and beta two must be different. If these are not different, then identification is, is, is quite, uh, quite difficult. In fact, it is impossible to identify uh, these two models or these two segments if, if the betas are the same. So empirical identification issues are quite common. And in order to deal with them, uh, the literature typically employs uh, the EM algorithm. It is just a statistical method that allows for a nice uh, way of maximizing or getting the maximum of the like, maximum likelihood estimator. Uh, it, it has the ability to, to, over, to overcome the empirical identification issues, but unfortunately, it is quite vulnerable to uh, local maxima. In other words, the likelihood function has many peaks, and unfortunately, the EM algorithm tends, tends to stay and reach only uh, a random peak, a random 
speak of the likelihood function, and it would not necessarily converge to the uh, main peak, which will be the uh, global maximum. So in order to deal with this issue, uh, what we what the literature typically does is to um, uh, implement multiple random starting points. In other words, they uh, they launch many, many, many AM algorithms uh, that start at, at different points, and then uh, we just choose the one that picks the highest likelihood value. Okay. Okay. So uh, so I, I would need to. Um, Okay, I have some words to say here. Okay, what are the typical softwares that we tend to use in order to, uh, to deal with uh, this type of estimation? There are many softwares that are available. And um, in the literature, uh, we've been, uh, we've been uh, producing these models in the statistics and the psychometric literature. And almost every econometric and statistical software has at procedures to deal with this uh, type of estimations. Uh, in particular, we, we as economists are quite uh, familiar with Stata, uh, but Stata uh, has a particular model, which is the GSM model, module, part, sorry, uh, that even though um, that, that works nice, that works well with simpler models, that with linear models like the one I show, uh, with only a few hidden groups, when there is only a few hidden groups and the model is linear, GSM works quite good. But in more general applications, uh, it, it starts to really underperforms other softwares that are very quite popular in the statistics and um, psychometric literature, such as M, uh, LIMDEP, uh, SAS, uh, R, Python, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it, is, it is quite important to to realize that Stata will not be the first choice if you're going to implement models that are not that simple. Uh, but, but a very nice feature is that Stata has links to work with those softwares. For instance, uh, Stata has a, um, a command that has been produced by I, a given researcher. I don't know his name. I don't remember his name. But you can run M plus from Stata, which makes it, makes it very convenient. So now I'm going to present uh, our, our application. Uh, the, follow, the following slides uh, at some point provided too much too, uh, too much detail, so I'm not going to stop. Uh, I'm not going to focus in all the details. So uh, I will, I'm going to skip from time to time uh, these slides that that become uh, too technical. Uh, but the overall objective is to uh, produce an, an econometric model that allows uh, that allows the modeling of involve um, of 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 uh, the uh, involuntary or voluntary informal employment, while taking into account the role of non-pecuniary earnings uh, that are associated uh, through informality. So in a nutshell, before you get bored with my presentation, what we find is that a significant share of informal workers, 62% uh, out of the 66% in 2013, uh, would prefer to work elsewhere at the formal sector at, or as formal employ employees. That's around 93% of the informal uh, group. Uh, with regards to formal workers, well, it is also possible to monitor whether uh, some share of formal workers could eventually wish to transit to a given segment of the informal, of the informal sector. The informal sector has its own benefits, as you may imagine, uh, although it is a very, um, uh, uh, risky labor status, they may, it may have some benefits for some people, given the non-pecuniary illness associated to it. So what we find is that 8% out of 34% uh, of formal workers uh, may wish to transit to uh, formal informal uh, employment status. So this is, again, the, the outline of the presentation. Just to remind us uh, where we are, I just gave the, the motivation. Uh, and now I'm going to start with the uh, uh, literature review on the uh, specific uh, problem we are assessing. Uh, when modeling informal employment, there are two uh, two dominant views. One one view uh, specifies that markets are segmented, and therefore markets are dual. In other words, uh, people that is working, people working at the informal sector or informal uh, or at informal jobs, uh, are probably queuing 
uh, for better jobs at the formal sector. Uh, therefore, we assume that informal jobs are non non um, uh, non desirable. Informal employment under under this approach is involuntary because workers do not have the choice of going into a formal job. It is the, therefore it is a last resort. It is a last resourced resort choice. Uh, a complementary view uh, states that informal uh, informal jobs may be attractive by themselves. And that people may transition into informal jobs because it uh, because we live or we move in a competitive market, and uh, there are uh, some uh, advantages associated to the fact of working at uh, an informal job. Uh, therefore, um, as you can imagine, this view assumes that informal workers are there because they are better off at this segment. Now we have a synthetic view where these two uh, competitive uh, where these two views may coexist there might be uh, uh, last resort workers and there might be voluntary workers both at informal segment and this has been more clearly stated in the literature that studies uh, firms and uh, uh, that studies firms rather than jobs in this type of literature uh, there are papers that have been clearly that have clearly identified upper and lower uh, tires uh, in the upper tire, you have um, uh, firms that uh, uh, that are quite healthy financially, while, whereas in the lower uh, tire, you have firms that are uh, struggling to survive. There are also uh, taxonomies that allow allow researchers to classify uh, some firms uh, from from the others. So, what is uh, what does what what are our main methodological concerns? Well, in this application, as, as I have said, the main methodological concern is to introduce non-pecuniary earnings uh, into the modeling of the uh, choice of the informal sector. Our econometric model is, uh, uh, you can imagine, a latent class model, which extends the Kuntra Larnau 2012 paper of uh, the Journal of Development Economics. Uh, and the novelty is that we introduce uh, the the utility maximization uh, of workers instead of the wage maximization of workers. Uh, with regards to Gunther and Gunther and Nob, I modeled the fact of being voluntary or involuntary by just looking at wages. They assume that workers were wage maximizers, whereas in this work, we're going to assume that workers also maximize uh, or rather maximize uh, a, unity, a utility function that, that depends on consumption and on leisure. So in order to integrate leisure into the equation, we need to model working hours because by uh, being capable of uh, forecasting working hours for the many segments, we will be able to forecast the leisure of each segment. So um, this is uh, some of the technical part. I will try to skip some of it. Uh, please uh, ask me whatever you may want at the end. Uh, if I don't provide, uh, because I will not be providing full details. Uh, as I said, we're going to model not only wage equations, but we're going to model uh, working hours equations for the many segments of our labor market. We're going to assume that we have one uh, formal segment and then uh, many uh, informal segments. Within the informal uh, sector, there might be many formal segments. Although at the end of the day, you will see that we will retain only two, just like Gunther and Nob did. So the formal segment is observed. We do know whether our work is formal, but within, within the informal segment, we don't know whether uh, an informal worker belongs to an upper, tier, an upper tier or a lower tier group. That's something we don't know. We must model also for the, uh, we must correct for, this, for the sample selection bias, right? So we must uh, uh, have an equation for the probability of being employed or not that we're going to use uh, in order to implement the correction. Uh, our model will not be as simple as the naive model I motivated at the beginning because we're going to introduce a, a, a sample selectivity bias correction that will allow us to get a conditional density, a conditional joint density for joint for working hours and wages, given the fact of working, given the fact of being employed. Uh, this is the analytical formula, uh, and this is the important feature. G is the uh, 
is the likelihood of the ice observation, the likelihood of uh, the joint working hours and wages. And for formal workers, it is quite simple. Where formal workers are observed, we know that they are formal, so the density is, is, is fixed, but must be weighted by a, the probability of being formal. Uh, and the novelty uh, comes here. This is the likelihood of the informal workers, those that do not belong to the formal sector. And as you can see, this is an average of a J minus one segment, uh, where each segment is weighted by the pi J probability. So we don't know into which uh, group does uh, do a, um, a given informal worker belongs. Well, this is uh, again a technicality regarding the uh, way of writing the likelihood and how do we configure our, our model in order to get proper vari variance covariance estimations, some, uh, some um, mentions on the way we, we deal with this pseudo likelihood approach, which is not that important for this, uh, for this uh, talk. Um, let me jump to two more important uh, features. So here, here is a very important feature. We assume that there is an, an, an underlying utility function. This is not observed, which depends on an inner utility. This inner utility can be understood as a composite. I mean, uh, as we, we're all familiar with composites. This is a composite that depends on consumption, which at the same time depends on uh, labor income. Labor income equals uh, hourly wages time working hours. And leisure. Leisure depends on working hours, right? So we're going to assume that the utility depends on a composite, which at the same time determines the utility function. The only uh, assumption that we need is the, mono the monotonicity between our uh, utility function and, and our inner utility or composite. That's the only thing we need. Uh, if uh, uh, That's the only thing we need. In other words, we're gonna we're gonna estimate whether a worker is or has a highest utility, not by comparing utilities, by but by comparing the composite. Okay, so once we estimate the model, we are we will be able to estimate the consumption, and the consumption can be uh, easily retrieved by by estimating uh, working hours and wages at a given segment, and the same leisure can be est estimated by assuming that a given share or a given share of the total available time of, of a household or an individual is allocated to uh, um, uh, house core activities, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, commuting, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in this, in this uh, term, you have uh, the, the, the total available time and in this term here, you have the working hours. So the difference between the left and right term be, uh, uh, retrieves or gives us the, uh, the leisure. Uh, for if you want more details regarding this, these parameters, please uh, do not hesitate in, in contact me, contacting me after the, the presentation. I can share with you the paper. We were using a parallel survey in order to, uh, to get these parameters. Now, in order to make comparable the amount or the magnitude of consumption in Peruvian solids and the amount of leisure in, in, in hours, we need to standardize both, right? Because the uh, scales are different. It wouldn't make sense, any sense to try to calculate uh, an inner utility or composite with, with uh, uh, measurement units. So we get rid of them by dividing each term by the medium uh, consumption and the medium leisure time. And as you can see, we, are, we will be able to estimate these inner utilities um, uh, for every J, which means for formal workers and for informal workers at the two regimes that we are looking at. Okay, uh, okay. Again, this is a, a little bit of technicalities regarding of how do we make the analysis of transitions, hypothetical transitions for, from uh, formal to informal uh, segments. So, but uh, so what I really would like to motivate is the following. Uh, here you see the original data. So at the left, in the left panel, you see uh, world hourly wages, and as you can see, formal workers tend to have higher wages. The wage distribution is shifted to the right, and other in the right panel, you see uh, working hours. And as you can see, informal workers tend to have uh, a bulk uh, of, of a mass of distribution at the left which is signaling 
the, the availability of, um, of flexibilities regarding the amount of working hours that informal workers may have. Uh, informal workers may, have, may work uh, so, uh, one hour, two hours, part-time, full-time. This is a flexibility that uh, formal workers may not necessarily have. So this may be, this may be particularly appealing for, uh, for instance, for women that will necessitate some time to, to allocate to house, household activities. Um, okay. While implementing our results, our results uh, suggested that we should stick to three segments, one formal and two hidden informal segments, right? So uh, what we did uh, is to um, estimate the counterfactual wage and working hours distributions for both formal and informal workers. In the upper panel, you have uh, the, the, in the upper left panel, you have the counterfactual distribution of uh, former workers' uh, hourly wages, log hourly wages. And, the, and in the upper right panel, you have their working hours counterfactual distribution. As you can see, we have three in each one of them, given that, as, as I said, we have three segments, formal and two, one formal and two informal. In the lower panel, uh, you have the same uh, configuration the three counterfactual distributions for informal workers uh, given uh, with regards to, to their wages and their counterfactual distributions of their uh, working hours. So this is not that important. This is just to motivate or to visualize the fact that we are capable of estimating this counterfactual distribution. And from this counterfactual distribution, we will be able to estimate the uh, inner utilities by assuming, by imposing a, a given value uh, of, of alpha. We need to impose a given value of alpha in order to get a sense of, of these inner utilities or composites. So I'm going to zoom in here. The most important plot is this one. Okay. Uh, in the upper left uh, uh, figure, we have two types of bars, uh, the gray and the purple bar, or blue bar, I don't know. So uh, the the blue or purple bar is, is telling us what is the size of the current segment. I mean, for instance, if you look at the formal segment, you see that we are around uh, 35 or 37. This is telling us that the size of the formal sector or the, is around 37. Now, if you go into the next bar, the gray one, it is telling us what the formal segment would be. Uh, if uh, workers would be able to transition freely from informal work jobs to formal jobs. How did we get this? Uh, we simply calculated the counterfactual uh, utilities of informal workers. And in many cases, informal workers had a higher, inf a higher inner, inner utility at a formal job. And what we did is just to calculate the share of workers that had their highest uh, inner utility at the formal job and this gave us this, this big bar here. Uh, okay, so let me keep. Now let's focus. So this makes sense, right? This makes totally sense. This is telling us that uh, if people had a choice, they should go straight to the formal jobs, to formal jobs. Now let's see uh, informal one and informal two. Informal one is one of the two segments that had, that, uh, had been, have been identified by the Latin, Latin class uh, model. Uh, in the, the purple bar is telling us what is the current size of this segment. It is around 40%. And the gray bar, which is almost nothing, is telling us what would, um, what would be the share of, of, of this informal segment should, uh, sh in, if workers had the opportunity to move to this segment freely. So nobody would like to be in this segment. As you can see, there's no one. And in the other segment, you can see that the current size uh, is estimated at around 25 uh, or 28%, and around 18 to 19% would like to, to stay at this, uh, at this informal segment. So from this picture, it is clearly, you can clearly see that one of these two segments is uh, appealing to, infor to, to workers, whereas the other one is, uh, is, 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 is a really involuntary situation. Uh, this, uh, these figures have been calculated using an alpha for the composite of 0.7. And in order to have a sense of whether our alpha is uh, disrupting our results, uh, we produce uh, alternative gray bars 
and under, give, and under different values of alpha. This bar here that you can see uh, has been uh, repeated in the upper right panel under different values of alpha. And you can see that uh, the, 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 values, the values of the gray bar stay relatively uh, or recent, stay relatively uh, constant when alpha is above 0.7. So this is why we pick 0.7, right? And it makes sense. Uh, in Gunther and Lano paper, the authors claim that uh, wages must be dominating into the, uh, into the uh, implied uh, utility um, maximization process. So in a model that considers ut a utility maximization, maximization process, we should probably give more weight to consumption than to leisure. And we did the same to, to evaluate the impact of alpha on the alternative uh, grade or counterfactual distributions. And, and as you can see, uh, they do not change that much, right? This tiny, tiny uh, share stays really small uh, when we move uh, the value of alpha. And uh, this, this share, the share of the voluntary, voluntary workers at the informal two segment uh, tends to be relatively constant when we uh, keep values of alpha above 0.7. Okay, so now let's move forward. Uh, okay, I, I think that the, I, I don't need to to present this. This is a bit a bit technical, but uh, what I'm going to motivate is the conclusions. Given this information, we were able to uh, estimate uh, what is the share of informal workers that are involuntary into a, in any of these two informal segments. We did some transition analysis uh, with uh, alternative values of alpha. And the final conclusion was that 62% out of the 66%, uh, which, which was the informal labor employment at night, 2003, are, are, are involuntary. Uh, this, is, this, this is, of course, uh, this depends, of course, on, on the value of alpha, which has fixed to 0.7. Uh, this means that 93% of or 94% of the informal employment uh, labor is, is involuntary according to these figures. Uh, we can do the same uh, with, the formal, with formal workers. Formal workers may eventually wish to go into any of these two informal segments because of the implied uh, non-pecuniary earnings such as leisure. And this applies uh, to, to women, as you can imagine, and most, more, more than men. And we find that 8% out of the 34% of formal employed, uh, formal labor uh, were, uh, were willing to transition into any of these informal uh, segments. Uh, OK, uh, well, I have more figures that I would like to share if you have questions. But I will I'll try to keep it simple. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jorge, for that. Uh, very that was a very interesting presentation. Um, I think uh, some of the attendees are very interested in the in the technical details, so it's good to have the the recording and also maybe the slides. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, please use please use the Q and A button. Um, you can use the chat box as well. So. Um, my, I have a, a, a question uh, in the meantime. <laughs> so do, do you have, um, uh, have you analyzed uh, these uh, informal um, workers, uh, their characteristics, uh, you know, to make, uh, have a better understanding of, uh, and, and also the formal ones that, you know, that uh, value the, the some of the informal, the features of the informal employment. So what, what are the characteristics of these, uh, of these groups? Uh, like by uh, gender okay, yes. or skills or sector or something like that? Yes. 
I mean, uh, well, th this is a, um, a preliminary version of a preliminary version of the uh, final uh, estimation that we are trying to publish. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the in our in our latest estimations, what we find is that women uh, that the gender and women is probably the characteristic that is the most important one into this determination of, of voluntary and involuntary employment. Apparently, or uh, not apparently, it's quite uh, quite well known in the informal in the labor economics literature. Women tend to uh, uh, value uh, time allocated for home activities more than men. And when we calculate this difference, uh, when we calculate leisure. So it, it, it is quite uh, quite straightforward to to realize that uh, they that women are, will be more likely to to prefer informal jobs with respect to men. So that's the key the key characteristic. And just to to complement that question, um, and I didn't talk about it uh, in the presentation. Uh, fortunately, in Peru, uh, there was uh, a survey that. Uh, was focused on how do people employ their time, uh, and from that from that survey, we were allowed to uh, make some some imputations in, in, into uh, into different time allocations uh, for different types of individuals depending on their characteristics, and and it, it is also there that we we'll see that gender is a, uh, it's, it's the main determinant of of the way uh, people um, allocate their time. Great, thank you. So we have a couple of questions. Um, one of them says, when trying to investigate the relationship between lower tier informal sector and say poverty, can this model be adapted for this? Do we have to, be, to first be sure that the informality is involuntary invon invon or not? Okay, uh, I mean, I mean, I think that that model, the, the model does exactly the same. I mean, uh, we are not assuming. Um, let, let me go to to the following slides. Uh, we are not assuming that one of these segments is involuntary. As you can see, we have two, right? We may have had many more. Um, involuntary workers may be hidden into many of these informal segments. Uh, we we retained only two because the statistical criteria suggested that we, that we retained two. And in the second informal segment, we seem to have more voluntary workers, as you can see by the gray bar, than non-voluntary. Whereas in the informal one segment, we seem to have mostly non-voluntary workers. So um, it is perfectly possible to have many informal segments, an upper tier, tier a lower tier, and even a medium tier, if you want, uh, that uh, where 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 you, you could you could have nested involuntary and voluntary workers within each tier. I mean, you may have non-voluntary workers into each tier, upper and lower tier as well. That that's that's not an issue. So this type of model is perfectly capable of of, of dealing with with that. Great. Um, we have another question on gender. Uh, um, Jacqueline asks, uh, to what extent gender-specific time allocation is taken into account when you fix parameters in expected inner utility? Okay, that's a pretty good question. Um, in this version of the model, we are not presenting a breakdown, uh, a gender breakdown. Uh, in a forthcoming version that will be prepared for publication, we expect to disentangle or to break down the model into uh, into male and female, because this was supposed to be a motivating example to uh, to the to, to the use of usefulness of the latent class approach. We didn't present this, that breakdown, but yes, it can be done. You can estimate two different models, two independent models, one for male and one for female, and uh, and and I suppose uh, that the, the results will be more striking. I mean. We're still dealing with the programming issues of doing doing this uh, because there is, there are some computational aspects, but uh, it can be done. We just need to break it down. I, I hope that for our, for our, for our, our forthcoming version, you will have this this split. Okay. 
Any other questions? Uh, okay, just uh, a comment. I, I, I have, uh, okay, I will upload or I will uh, share the presentation, of course. Uh, but as you have noticed, there were some technical details that I skipped. And I'll be happy to add some details regarding the software because uh, there might be some interesting interest regarding uh, software details. Uh, so I'll be happy to, to enhance this presentation with a couple of, of comments or regarding how to use GSM and how to use uh, Stata with M+, uh, it will be very easy to me. Um, and if you have any other questions, please feel free to get in touch. Uh, uh, that's it. So this this uh, this is a preliminary version and you're uh, working on the final version of the paper of uh, to be published. So that's... Uh... Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so given the scope of the of the webinar, uh, I did. I wanted to start with a broad motivation rather than going straight into the paper because most people is not necessarily familiar with with uh, with the model. So uh, I prefer to present a, a more parsimonious version of the of the final uh, model. Um, but um, in, in the forthcoming version, the, the great difference or the main difference will be the fact of, that we'll be getting a breakdown between male and, and female, plus some technicalities. But, but what, I, what I was saying is that I, I, will, I will share on a slide with some additional details regarding the implementation. What type of commands should you use or could you use if you want to try it on your own using GSM? If you have M plus, well, you can link Stata with M plus, and you may uh, you may want to, to give it a try. So I will add a few slides to this presentation so that you can you can share it. Great, I think that will be very useful for many researchers. Okay, so thank you very much, Jorge, for the presentation and, uh, and this um, this paper, this very interesting uh, topic. So um, thank you, thank you everybody, everybody for joining today and we hope to see you in the next uh, webinar which uh, will take place uh, in a month, uh, I think it's November 26th, uh, but uh, yeah, 25th, uh, so um, hope to see you there and um, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, have a nice day. Bye.